نستأنف فعاليات المؤتمر بالجلسة الثانية تحت عنوان المتغيرات الجيوسياسية في العالم العربي العالم ومنها العالم العربي ضيفنا لهذه الجلسة الدكتور براغ خنا والدكتور براغ خنا هو حامل الجنسية الأمريكية من أصل هندي أمضى الفترة اليسيرة من شبابه في إمارة أبو ظبي حامل لشهادة الدكتوراه من كلية لندن الاقتصادية له العديد من المؤلفات طبعا أبرزها الكتاب عالم الجديد مؤخرا الذي أفرد فيه حيزا كبيرا للدول العربية ولمنطقة الشرق الأوسط حول المتغيرات الجيوسياسية في العالم وحاليا يشغل منصب زميل باحث في مؤسسة أمريكا الجديدة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية الدكتور خنا أمضى وقتا طويلا في الشرق الأوسط لا سيما مؤخرا في العراق وفي أفغانستان وطبعا ربما الكثير منا هنا قد شاهده في السابق على أحدى المحطات التلفزة حول المواضيع الجيوسياسية في العالم وتأثيرها على المنطقة العربية يحاول الدكتور خنا الأستاذ نديم قطيش وهو إعلامي في قناة المستقبل الإخبارية وله باع طويل في العمل الصحفي وقد عمل في عدة مناصب أبرزها كمحرر في جريدة النهار وفي جريدة الحياة العربية وهو معد لبرامج إخبارية وكذلك مقدم لبرنامج بيت الياك على قناة المستقبل الإخبارية سنبدأ هذه الجلسة بعرض من الدكتور خانة لمدة عشرين دقيقة ومن بعدها يبدأ الحوار مع الأستاذ نديم دكتور خانة بليز السلام عليكم The theme of today's conference is Arab shaping their own future. And what I want to do today is to talk to you literally about the shape of the Arab world. I'm going to talk to you about geopolitics. Geopolitics is the relationship between power and space. And geopolitical problems emerge from the mismatch of territory, resources, and people. How are we to make sense, because that is the theme also today, taking, making sense and taking action. How do we make new sense of the Arab political geography? And there are some very key questions that we have to ask to answer this question. Is the Arab geopolitical story a story of oppression and disadvantage? For centuries, there is a narrative that says the Arab world has been dominated by the Europeans, the Ottomans, and now the United States or Israel. Is that still true? Or can we see it differently? Is the Arab geography a blessing, the blessing of centrality. The Arab world sits at the center of the world, the crossroads of the major continents and the major civilizations. That is one way to begin to make new sense of where the Arab world is in the 21st century. Let's ask another question and turn the narrative on its head. Who is the real enemy? Is it, in fact, the regional powers that have historically intervened in the region or foreign imperialists? What if today Arabs are your own worst enemy, proudly clinging to colonial borders 
the Sykes-Picot Agreement as the governing principle still of borders in the region inherited illegitimate borders. Can there be enough of a new Arabism to counter these legacies of insecurity and nationalism? Even in Africa today, they're moving beyond the Congress of Berlin that set their borders in the late 19th century. All across Africa, I see regional integration, sub-regional integration, smaller countries combining forces, investing together, building a better future. Shouldn't the Arab world do the same? Are Arabs, in other words, going to continue to be an obstacle to their own progress, or can they help each other enough the way I see happening in other parts of the world? And another question, then, combining these observations, what if we redraw the map? What should it look like? Should it look like the caliphate? Or should states fragment even further, representing all of the possible minorities that there are in the region? Where would this map ever settle? What would be its end state? What would it look like? And here in particular, it's important to address the Arab youth, the majority of the population in this region. Survey after survey shows that Arab youth view what they have in common as their culture and their language and their history and not the, the politics of nationalism that has divided them. They believe that their region should have fewer internal divisions than other parts of the world. So what will it take to bring about to achieve this renaissance? I will say this, no one will help you to get to this renaissance if you don't help yourselves. So let's turn to the Arab relationship to the great powers in geopolitics and globalization. To me, again, this is the central region of the world. It is not a client of the United States or of Europe. It is practicing what I call multi-alignment. The, after the Cold War, one no longer has to choose one side or the other. The smart diplomacy lies in playing all sides. It lies in exporting to China, trading with Europe, investing outward to Africa, all of these things the Arab world is starting to do. And that means being an active participant in globalization. The world, of course, depends on the resources of the Arab region. Many of you are familiar with the Arab Human Development Report, which talked in very strong language even saying that there is a depravity in this part of the world. That's not the way I see the Arab world today, given the resources that you have. Unlike other parts of the world, in fact, the Arab region has all of the wealth, all of the resources that it could ever need to develop itself, to modernize itself, to take advantage of globalization. It's a question of policy. Arab policy, not others' policies, your policies. And not only do you play a central role in that globalization, but the most important facets of globalization that are happening actually today are within regions, not just across them. Look at all of the examples that this region is rich with today. Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, Rotana, Look at the migration that is taking place on a scale that's never happened before within the Arab world. The melting pots, particularly in the Gulf, places like Beirut as it was, Dubai, Doha. Look at the foreign investment from the Gulf countries outward across the Arab world, from Morocco to Syria. This is intra-Arab globalization. Look at the flight connections the short-haul flights that all of you are able to take to connect to each other very quickly and efficiently. Websites like Zawiya. There are so many ways in which there is internal Arab globalization, and that is such an important part 
of developing this region's unity in the future. And again, it is the young generation that I see from every country in the Arab world that demonstrates a sense of unity through language and values and the internet. I find it most perverse, ridiculous, in fact, that there are still so many visa requirements within the Arab world. Why? Look at other places in the world. Do they do this to each other? Not really. Does someone from the outside have to say that it's time to change these practices? They shouldn't have to. So which lines on the map matter and which ones don't? Is it the colonial lines or is it the pipelines or is it the railways? I don't believe that the younger generation that views its world as borderless wants to continue to focus on borders. I believe that other lines matter more. And I'm going to start in, with this uh, demonstration and show you some. But I'm going to start with a minority. I'm going to start actually with the Kurds. The Kurdistan dilemma, 3,000 years old. How will it be managed? Do Arabs need to dominate the Kurds? What is another way to look at the strategic resources and the geography of this region? Cannot the resources that exist in northern Iraq be shared? Can they not serve all sides, even if there is an independent state of Kurdistan one day? Look at it. It's landlocked. Landlocked countries have no choice but to get along with their neighbors. In the case of the Kurds, that means Iraq, that means Syria, that means Iran, that means Turkey. But those resources should be facilitated by the neighbors, not inhibited by the neighbors. What the Arab world should focus on, not only is in developing a stable relationship with the Kurdish region, but then focusing at the same time and ever more on the Arab Iraq. Why has it taken so long, we all know, of course, to rehabilitate Iraq? But it can start now, and it should start now. And it would still be, with or without Kurdistan, of course, one of the top oil producers in the entire world. And there is a role for Lebanon, for Jordan, for Saudi Arabia, for Syria, for the neighbors to contribute to this rehabilitation that must finally begin and must happen much, much more quickly. It's almost a decade now. Let's look at another situation. Of course, this is Palestine. And let's apply the same principle. Who has heard of the Ark? Not many people. Who has heard of the Ark? The Ark is a proposal to unite the divided parts of Arab Palestine. We need this Ark. It is a proposal to create a corridor of infrastructure, of rails, road, public services, water, irrigation, to bring the West Bank and Gaza together again. They need an airport. They need a seaport. In an independence that is imminent, that we know is coming, will still be futile without this infrastructure. Independence without infrastructure is futile. Decades of negotiations on the White House lawn, Camp David, other sorts of places, maybe have not yet delivered independence, but even if they do, this infrastructure is necessary. Who will make this arc real? Why is anyone waiting for whether or not the Europeans will fund it, whether the Americans will allow it? Just do it. The next generation has to do it in order to avoid the historical cycles of hatred and conflict. Now let's think about the entire region again. Let's zoom back. When was 
this region? When was the Arab world, when was the Middle East last borderless the way we would like it to be again? It was during the Ottoman era. The Hejaz Railway. The Hejaz Railway transported pilgrims from Istanbul all the way to Medina. It even had a small branch that connected to Haifa on the Mediterranean Sea. Today, it lies in ruins. Why? Why is the region not connecting itself again? Already you can see, not only is there a need to resurrect the Hejaz Railway, but to reconnect to Cairo, to Baghdad, even, yes, all the way to Tehran. Because if not, other countries are doing it. Look at this, Turkey to Iran, all the way to Pakistan. This railway opened last year. Trade is growing. Countries are integrating. Markets are deepening. The Arab world has to do the same. Here is one start, one idea, the GCC high-speed rail infrastructure. And this is just rail. What about the environment? What about water? What about all of the things that Arab nations can do to repair the mismatch of territory, resources, and people? Infrastructure works to bring down borders. Look at Europe. Today it has 27 members, the largest economic bloc in the world, 500 million citizens. So often when I'm in Europe, I remind them, Britain, Germany, France, one by one, I always say, none of you individually is strategically important in the world unless they work together. Can Britain resolve its problems and its former colonial possessions in the Commonwealth countries, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Pakistan? No. And France and Africa? No. Only together, only as the European Union. So let me give, send the same exact message here. There is only a limited amount of time, a limited amount of patience before the rest of the world might move on. Move.